When I was a child, I wondered about the nature of God. And I was comforted by the notion that God is love. As I grew older, I perceived God less as a person and more as an action. And I turned the phrase around saying, love is God. I found little proof for God, but I could judge by my experience that love indeed existed. But recent brain research has raised a question about the very nature of love and the human impulse towards God. In their book, A General Theory of Love, Thomas Lewis, Fari Amini, and Richard Lannan explore the biochemistry of human bonding. They describe the brain as having three parts, calling the first the reptilian brain, the basic brain stem that is found in fish, reptiles, and lower animals. It's the part of the brain that controls breathing, heartbeat, survival reflexes, like running from danger or towards prey. The parenting style of reptiles is neglect. Lay many eggs and hope that some survive. Baby crocodiles are better not having their parents around because the mother might eat them. Now the second part of the brain is the limbic brain. It wraps itself around the top of the brain stem and includes the hippocampus and is generally where the basic emotional responses begin. This area is the great separation between mammals and reptiles. This is responsible for the nurturing relationships between mothers and their young. Remove a mother from a young mammal and you will always, always result in a separation cry from the young pup, kitten, cub, or child. The third part of the brain is the neocortex. This is the part of the brain that interprets emotions and creates symbols and is able to plan. It's what transforms fear in the limbic brain into paranoia when you start thinking about your fears. <laughs> it transforms sadness into melancholy. It transforms anger into hatred and happiness into optimism. While the limbic brain functions on the level of transient emotions, the neocortex gives those feelings permanence by surrounding them with meaning. The neocortex of a rat is smaller than cats, which is smaller than dogs. Primates have li larger cortexes and humans the largest of all. We humans, therefore, place a high degree of importance on the ability to think. Lewis, Amini, and Lannan write, because people are most aware of the verbal, rational parts of their brain, they assume that every part of their brain should be amenable to the pressure of argument and will. Not so. Words, good ideas, and logic mean nothing to at least two brains out of three. <laughs> A person cannot direct his emotional life in the way he bids his motor system to reach for a cup. He cannot will himself to want the right thing or love the right person. Emotional life can be influenced, but it cannot be commanded. Thus, we have the classic struggle between heart and head, which is in reality the struggle between the limbic brain and the neocortex. Now, it is important to realize that the symbolism of the heart has reality. I doubt if you tell somebody, I love you with all my limbic system, <laughs> you'll get very good results. <laughs> the term heart is poetic, and poetry is one of the bridges between the limbic and neocortical regions of the brain. But sometimes what occurs between lovers is truly chemical. 
in an infatuation, separation can be almost unbearable. There is a rise in certain brain chemicals, cortisol and catecholamines, the same as a puppy separated from his mother. Hence the term poetic and scientific puppy love. At this level, absence does make the heart grow fonder, but if the absence is prolonged, the brain chemistry changes. Despair sets in. Levels of growth hormones drop. The immune system is suppressed. In babies, the syndrome is called failure to thrive. And widows and widowers are at most risk of dying in the first year after a spouse dies. They may literally die of a broken heart. Our regulation of our limbic system is influenced by others. Mammals, in varying degrees, use social systems to regulate each other's behavior and body functions. The relationship between a mother and an infant show how a loop can affect one physically. A mother lactates when she hears her child cry. As we grow older, humans learn to self-regulate their physical and emotional status but we never fully become independent of our limbic brain. We need others to be emotionally stable. Lewis and others write, stability means finding people who regulate you well and staying near them. <laughs> Not a very romantic thing. I have never said that in one of my weddings. <laughs> Chemicals primarily regulate the limbic system, serotonin, opiates, and oxytocin. On the order of service today, what you have, uh, Karen found the chemical structure of oxytocin, and then she added a little cupid to give it a little extra bump. This love chemical is a chemical that plays a long role, role in long-term binding. Prairie dogs and mountain voles are almost identical. But prairie dogs mate for life and are more nurturing to their young. And their oxytocin levels are higher. Mountain voles, because they live where there's a lot of places to hide, don't need the bonding of large families and groups and they have very low oxytocin levels. Now oxytocin levels sur surge in mothers around birth and surges in children around puberty when they get their first crushes. Have you checked your partner's oxytocin level lately? <laughs> if a couple took medicine to raise their oxytocin level, they may experience being in love all over again. But would they really be in love? Fortunately or unfortunately, depending how you look at it, they haven't been able to find artificial ways to raise your oxytocin. That actual oxytocin doesn't get through the blood-brain barrier. As pharmaceutical people will know more about that than I do. <laughs> but. And also, it'd be not very profitable for a pharmaceutical company to develop it because you'd have to be getting a medicine that you give to somebody else secretly. <laughs> because it does little good to fall hopelessly in love with someone who doesn't know you exist. It might result in some good poetry, but you're probably not in love. But people often fall in love with the same type of person over and over because the nature of relationships get imprinted on our brain when we are children. That we sang a song earlier today, make channels for the streams of love. And that's something we do, that the 19th century author of those words couldn't have known that as we develop patterns which release certain brain chemicals, 
then those like little grooves form in our brain and those are the patterns that we sometimes can fall into. And we might fall in love with the same type of person over and over again. We often ignore potential partners because somehow we do not click. They do not fall into our predetermined channels of love. We might not ever see Mr. or Ms. Wright because our mind's eye has been trained to notice specific cues. Now it's possible to fall in love with someone who is not your type, but it's as difficult as learning a foreign language. You have to learn to hear and speak and recognize a whole new set of symbols. Now when couples have fallen out of love, a therapist may give them homework as a set of games to play. These scenarios may seem artificial. By acting a certain way, the couple learns to re-regulate each other. They may be asked to just stand, sit holding hands and looking at each other for a half an hour. Imagine if someone told you to do that to your partner tonight. Could you really do that? It's so unusual to just sit in silence and hold hands and look and see what would happen. But it's part of that trying to dig new channels of love and to reinvigorate that love that happened as a flood maybe when you were in your 20s and you were uncontrollably swept away. Because couples sometimes fall out of sync because after being married for a while, they have separate jobs and separate lives, and sometimes it takes them in separate directions. There's a song by The Who that demonstrates how if they maintain a common interest, that they can keep the love going. I think this song is about a couple that shares an interest in music. It says, Mama has a squeeze box. She keeps on her chest. When Daddy gets home, he never gets no rest. They're playing all night, and the music's all right. Mama has a squeeze box. Daddy never sleeps at night. I'm sure that's about music. <laughs> Humans are wired to be interdependent. Lewis, Amani, and Hannon refer to it as the divine nature of our conjoined state. Being well-regulated in relatedness is a deeply gratifying state that people seek ceaselessly in romance, religions, cults, in husbands and wives, pets, softball teams, bowling leagues, and thousands other features of human life driven for the thirst for sustaining affiliations. It's understandable why metaphors about relationships with God borrow from the human experience. God the Father, or the church being the bride of Christ. In Greek mythology, the gods are always having sex with humans, and mystics talk of being one with God. And it's been shown that religious experience is correlated with brain chemistry. In a book, Why God Won't Go Away, published by, uh, by Andrew Newberg, written by him, they use brain imaging data collected from Tibetan Buddhists, lost in meditation, and from Franciscan nuns deep in prayer to explain how it is that religious rituals have the power to move believers and non-believers alike. Through monitoring blood flow, they found certain areas of the brain affected by religious experience. Attention is linked to concentration. The frontal lobe lights up during meditation. Religious emotions are found in the middle temporal lobe, and sacred images, the lower temporal lobe, is involved in the process by which images such as candles or crosses facilitate prayer and meditation. 
and response to religious words are at the juncture of the three lobes. This region governs the response to language and cosmic unity. When the parietal lobes quiet down, a person can feel at one with the universe. So if you want insight, <laughs> your frontal lobes. If you want oneness, <laughs> hit your back of your head and you might see stars and be one with the universe. <laughs> so what do these correlations prove? Is the brain responding to something that's really out there? Now you can stimulate the brain and make people see colors that are not there. But the concept of color remains real. Blue can be measured and understood as a certain wavelength of light. But if neuroceptors for love and religion exist, does that necessarily prove that love or God exists? Or are love and God just neocortical explanations of limbic impulses? Are they just the poetry we use to explain our instincts? The evolution of love is not certain, but the benefit of it is obvious. Because of our potential brain capacity, we are born underdeveloped. While our head is still small enough to pass through the birth canal, because we are so helpless, we need to have adult caregivers. Our thinking brain creates the social structures that reinforce our emotional bonding. We have rituals of child dedications, graduations, marriages, baby showers, all these thoughtful actions are connected to the emotional brain. They enhance social bonding and thus survival. Our social relatedness is a variation of the prairie dog. Those bonded were able to survive on the Great Plains where there's no place to hide and you need a group warning system. The mountain vole has more places to hide and thus leads needs less social support. But what is the evolutionary advantage of God? Part of the need arises precisely because our neocortex, precisely because we have the ability to give meaning to our emotions. They are no longer temporary. A sadness that becomes despair needs hope. A fear that becomes paranoia or shame needs salvation. An anger that becomes hate needs forgiveness and reconciliation. To prolong happiness, we count our blessings. Cultures around the world have developed rituals to massage their neural pathways. Being capable of imagining death, they needed to placate themselves. Some believed in heaven, some in resurrection, some in reincarnation, some in the spirit world of ancestors. Our ancestors worried about the weather. They prayed for rain to come. They prayed for rain to stop. They scanned the heavens for anything that would give them a clue to their fate. They prayed, and often enough, their prayers were answered. Behaviorally, it's good that prayers are only answered some of the time. B.F. Skinner, the behaviorist, said that when you're trying to extinguish a behavior, if prayers get answered all the time, and the first time that they don't get answered, then they start to doubt that. But if you want a rat to keep pressing the bar, you start spacing the rewards farther and farther apart because an intermittent reinforcement scale are harder to extinguish. And so when a rat only gets a pellet every 10 times, 
they will hit that bar more fervently. And if our prayers only get answered, sometimes the behavioral response of most people is to pray more fervently. So from the perspective of the prayer, they have intuitive proof that prayer works. And when it fails, it's because they didn't pray hard enough. Humans often know things before we understand things. We were able to raise crops before we knew how photosynthesis worked. We were able to sail before we knew the nature of wind. Is the human soul an illusion or just a reality we don't understand? Is love a reality that our brains know but cannot explain? We dreamed of flying long before we knew how. And once we learned how to fly, it ceased to be a miracle. People fast and see visions. People eat peyote and dream dreams. Are these moments of heightened perception or distorted perception? What will it mean if we can induce religious euphoria or pharmacologically stimulate peace on earth and goodwill to all? Will it be real? Would we care? Near my sister's home in Oregon, there's a place called Lithium Springs. <laughs> and it was a sacred place to Native Americans because they found out that they could more easily make treaties when drinking from the Lithium Springs. I imagine the bipolar among them who would break down and react poorly during negotiations were medicated and thus making the treaties easier <laughs> to write. So were those treaties made under false pretenses? And they probably often fell apart if they met in places other than Lithium Springs. If love can be reduced to the firing of neurochemicals, can we say that love is real? You could say that the presence of brain receptors is proof that such a thing as love is, exists, but that's the trouble with correlations. You cannot tell which causes which. What we call love is associated with brain chemistry, but which is the front prime mover? Which is the first call? And what about God? Is God the phantom leg that the amputee still feels? Or is it the paralyzed leg that is just beyond our perception? Which leg is more real? Our neurons dance around in a holy fire. Some can even pass through its flames, but we cannot hold it apart from the fuel of our existence. Our culture fawns over the fleetingness of falling in love while discounting the importance of loving, according to Lewis, Amani, and Lannan. Loving is limbically distinct from love. Loving is mutuality. Loving is synchronous attunement and modulation. And such adult love depends critically on knowing each other. Love, the emotion, may be limbic, but loving, the action, is something we do with our higher brain function. The authors make a distinction between the instant chemical reaction of being in love 
and the intentional interaction with another person that changes them as it changes you. In religious terms, the mountaintop experience is like falling in love. Some people have experiences where they just know there is a God. Others seldom, if ever, have these experiences. These experiences may be the perception of something real, but be aware that they are also something that can be induced. There is a whole industry of workshops that will sell you a transcendent weekend. It may be silence with the Trappist monks, fire walking, yoga, the sweat lodge, drumming, self-hypnosis, and more. And some people move from religion to religion looking for the ultimate transcendent experience. And others stick with one religion and keep increasing their fervent piety, trying continuously for religious ecstasy. But what is most important about your religion is when you come down from the mountaintop. What is most important about your relationships is what happens after you fall in love. How are your relationships affected? God, in the Old Testament, despises the festivals and requires justice instead. The New Testament says true religion is the helping of widows and orphans. Faith is knowing in some way that there is a God. Faithfulness is acting in a divine manner, doing the behaviors that build channels for the streams of love. Or to put it in non-theistic terms, transcendence is knowing that all is one. But interdependence is the work of building harmonious relationships. Knowing for sure that love and God exist, in my mind, is less important than acting loving and interdependent. For every willful act creates a neural pathway. Loving and interdependence become habits that sustain our love. Moments of being in love and finding transcendence may occur in our lives, and it matters little whether they are revelations or delusions. <clears throat> Who cares if you are truly seeing the light or being blinded by it? <clears throat> Enjoy the grace when it appears. But for the long term, know that when your heart stops racing, and the bush stops burning, and the brain chemistry stabilizes. Loveliness and holiness are practical pathways we can choose. May we choose wisely. <laughs>